girls. I'm back to finish with the Meet Kaya book, book one of Kaya. And uh, I'm here again with Kaya and her horse Steps High. And last time we read through chapter one. And so today I'm going to start with chapter two. Okay. Chapter two is called Switchings. Kaya ran along the riverbank, past women cleaning salmon and cutting the fish into thin strips. Auntie was laying the strips on racks to dry. She raised her hand in greeting when Kaya rushed by, but Kaya kept going. She ran up to some girls, setting up a little camp for their buckskin dolls. They'd made a travois with sticks and pieces of an old mute tool mat. A boy pretended to be their horse, pulling the travois. Have you seen Speaking Rain and my brothers, Kaya asked. The children shook their heads, and Kaya ran on, desperate to find them. The twins had never been like other little boys. They could understand each other without saying a word out loud. When they were born, the setting sun and the rising moon were both in the sky. Two lights in the sky and two babies who looked alike. They were special children. They could also be twice the trouble if they decided to play tricks. Kaya ran through some bushes and out onto the grassy bank where she'd last seen Speaking Rain with the boys. Speaking Rain crouched by a twisted pine tree, but the twins were nowhere in sight. Where are the boys, Kaya called. I don't know, Speaking Rain said, but I just found the toy I made for them. She held up a little hoop made of grass. They got tired of my game and ran off. I've been calling them, but they don't answer. Her cloudy eyes were wide with alarm. Maybe they fell in the river. Kaya caught her breath. Did you hear a splash? Speaking Rain shook her head. But where could they be? Maybe a cougar chased them. Cougars? Cougars sometimes went after small children. Kaya's heart raced, but she tried not to let Speaking Rain feel, feel her alarm. Come on, let's look for the boys. If they just ran off, they can't be far. She made herself sound confident, but she was frightened. The boys could be hurt or lost. Oh, why hadn't she thought of them instead of herself? Kaya looked around. Two trails led away from the riverbank. One turned upstream toward the women where the women worked. The other turned downstream. Dust-covered leaves hung low over the trail. The little boys probably would have been drawn to that leafy tunnel. Boys, Kaya called. Where are you? There was no answer. Follow me, Speaking R Kaya said to Speaking Rain. I'll look and you listen. Speaking Rain took hold of Kaya's sleeve and walked right behind her down the trail. I see their footprints in the dust, Kaya said. She walked faster. And here's where they left the trail and went under the bushes. They were crawling. We'll have to crawl too. Stay close. The girls got down on their hands and knees and inched forward. Leaves caught in their braids and brushed their cheeks. Kaya kept a lookout for the stick people hiding in the shadows. Maybe they'd led the boys deeper into the woods. A little farther on, the prince disappeared. Kaya sat back on her heels. I've lost their trail. Do you hear anything? Speaking Rain lifted her chin and frowned. I hear the river. There's swift water there. If the boys fell in, they'd be swept away. Kaya put her hand on Speaking Rain's shoulder. Let's keep going, she said. She began to search for Prince again. I think we should get others to help us, Speaking Rain said. Then she pointed up. Listen, I hear something up there. Kaya got to her feet and she could see over the bushes. An old spruce tree loomed overhead. A cougar might be crouching in the bushes or the boys. She'd been so busy 
following signs on the ground that she'd forgotten the twins could climb trees. A spruce branch trembled. Two pair of dark eyes gazed down at her from the green boughs. The boys were clinging to the trunk like raccoons. They were grinning. Kaya was flooded with relief. She was also angry that the boys had scared her in speaking rain. Come down right now, she said. The little boys crept down out of the tree in a shower of dry needles. When they reached the ground, they started to giggle. Kaya shook her hands and crouched to look into their eyes. Don't laugh, she said. Running off isn't a game. Dangers are everywhere. Yes, dangers are everywhere, a, a low voice said. Startled, Kaya and Speaking Ring turned. Someone was coming through the woods behind them. Hands parted the branches and Auntie stepped through. Her face was stern. When you ran by me, I sensed trouble. So I followed you, she said. Now I see I was right. I heard your mother tell you to look after your brothers, but you ran away from your responsibility. Kaya felt her face redden. She bit her lips. Auntie's words made her ache with shame. I'm sorry, she whispered. You should be sorry, Auntie said in a weary voice. I must call Whip Woman to teach you a lesson. As Kaya followed Auntie back to the camp, she kept a strong hold on her feelings so that they wouldn't show, but her eyes stung with unshed tears. She kept her gaze on her feet when Auntie went to fetch Whip Woman. The respected elders selected, selected to discipline children who misbehaved. When Whip Woman arrived, she carried a bundle of switches, but it wasn't the switches that Kaya dreaded. It was the bad opinion of the other children. When one child misbehaves, all the children were disciplined. They learned that when one of them, what, the, what one of them did affected all the rest. Come here, children, Whip Woman called out. Come here now, one by one. The children old enough to be switched came forward and lined up in front of Whip Woman. She laid her bundle of willow switches on the ground at her feet. Lie down on your stomachs and bare your legs, Whip Woman told them. She waited while everyone did as she said. Kaya laid down, pulled up her skirt up to her knees and pressed her mouth to the back of her hand. She heard the switch hissed through the air and felt it sting her legs, her bare legs. She winced, but she, she didn't cry out or make a sound. Whip women moved on to speaking rain, then to the next child. On and on she went until they'd all been given a switching. As the children lay there, Whip woman spoke to them slowly and firmly. Kaya didn't watch out for her brothers. They ran off into the woods. They could have been injured. Enemies could have carried them away. A magpie that thinks only of itself would have given the boys better care than Kaya did. Nimapu people always look out for each other. Our lives depend on it. Don't ever forget that, children. Now get up. When Kaya lifted her head, she caught sight of her parents and grandparents looking on. Their sad faces hurt her much more than the sting on her legs. Foxtail got to his knees near Kaya. He grimaced as he rubbed his legs. Magpie, he whispered to her. I'm going to call you Magpie. Magpie, Magpie, echoed the girl next to him. Speaking rain inched closer to Kaya and clasped her hand. Don't mind them, Speaking Rain said. It's all over now. But it wasn't over, Kaya thought with alarm. Magpie, is Magpie going to be my nickname? Will they never f let me forget this? These fish need to be prepared, Kaya's grandmother said to her. Hold these sticks and give, give them to me as I need them. 
It was later that day, and Ala was preparing a welcome meal for Kaya's family. She knelt on a tool mat with several salmon in front of her. She was ready to cut up the salmon and place wooden skewers in the pieces so that they could set by the fire to roast. Other women had dug deep pits to bake camas bulbs in. The delicious scent of roasting food filled the air. Kaya was glad to be at her grandmother's side. Her head still buzzed with all the trouble she'd caused. Her problems had started with her beloved horse. I raised steps high, but she tried to buck me off, Kaya confessed. Hmm, Allah muttered. She slid her knife up the belly of the salmon, cut off its head, and took out the innards and began to cut the rest into three long pieces. Her face shone with sweat from the heat of the fire. Her hands glistened with oil from the rich salmon. One by one, Kaya handed skewers to Allah. But I'm going to train her, Kaya said, thinking out loud. Someday I'm going to be the very best horsewoman. When she heard herself boast again, she bit her lip. Hmm, Allah muttered again. She laced a skewer through a large piece of fish. I've lived a long time, and I've known many fine horsewomen. First they cared for their families, then they trained their horses. You must think of others before yourself. She held out her hand for another skewer, and Kaya bowed her head at her grandmother's lecture. She felt a tear run down her nose. What's wrong, Allah asked. She laid aside a piece of fish and reached for the next one. Some children are calling me mad pie. They say I'm no more trustworthy than a thieving bird, Kaya said miserably. Nicknames, Allah said. Have I ever told you the awful nickname I got when I was your age? Her hands never stopped moving as she spoke. Uh, Kaya shook her head. She couldn't imagine her grandmother doing anything to earn an awful nickname. Finger cakes. That's what I was called, Allah said. Finger cakes. Kaya couldn't help but smile. Women ground up cow's roots and shaped the mixture into loaves or little finger cakes to dry. Everyone liked dried cow's cakes. That's a funny nickname, Kaya said. Why did they call you that? Her grandmother picked up another large salmon. My mother used to put a few finger cakes into my big brother's shoulder bag, she said. If he got hungry when he was hunting, he'd chew on the finger cakes. I was jealous that he got extra pieces of my favorite food. So sometimes when he wasn't looking, I'd steal some of his finger cakes. One day he caught me with my hand in his bag. And from then on, I was called Finger Cakes. Did they call you that for a long time? Kaya asked. Yes, I was Finger Cakes for a long time, Allah said. Every time I heard that nickname, I remembered I was wrong to steal my brother's food. Every time I, every time I heard the nickname, I vowed I'd never again take what wasn't mine. It was a strict teacher, that nickname. But you lost the nickname, didn't you? Kaya said. Her grandmother smiled. Let me tell you something. Sometimes an old friend will call me finger cakes just to tease me. After all these years, that nickname still pricks me like a thorn. She put down her knife and wiped her hands on the grass. These salmon are ready to roast now. Kaya was still troubled. Do you think I can lose my nickname, Allah? She asked. Her grandmother looked closely at Kaya. Her dark eyes seemed uh, to see right into Kaya's heart. Listen to me, Allah said. You're not a little girl any longer. You're growing up. Soon you'll prepare to go on your vision quest to seek your wayakin. 
Work hard to learn your lessons so that your nickname won't trouble you. And then your thoughts will be clear when the time comes for your vision quest. She pushed herself up from her knees. These fish need to be carried to the fire. Everyone is hungry. Kaya's family gathered beside their teepee for their evening meal. Allah had said, had laid several mule mats in a row on the grass. The men took their places on one side of the mats. The women set wooden bowls of salmon and baked kamas in the center and served the men. Then the women sat down across from them. Kaya's grandfather led them in giving thanks to Hanyawat, the creator. Uh, Kalutsa held out his hands over the feast. Are you paying attention, children? He said in a deep voice. Ah, hey, Kaya said with the other children. Hanyawat made this earth, Kalutsa said. He made Nimapu and all people. He made all living things on the earth. He made the water and placed the fish in it. He made the sky and, pl and places the birds in it. He created food for all his creatures. We respect and give thanks for his creation. After they all sang a blessing, each one took a sip of water, which sustains all life. Then they all took a tiny bite of salmon, grateful that the fish had given themselves to Nimapu for food. After that, Kalutsa motioned for the rest of the food to be passed. As Kaya ate, she was surrounded by her grandparents, her parents, her aunt and uncle, her aunts and uncles, and all of the children in her family. She gazed at her father with his sharp cheekbones and broad shoulders. She looked at her mother with her shining black hair and her straight brows. Kaya felt how much she loved them all and how much she needed them. She wanted to be worthy of their trust, to be a, a girl no one would call magpie ever again. It is morning. We are alive. The sun is witness to what we do today, the camp crier called. He made his way among the teepees to awaken everyone and announce the events of the day. Kaya opened her eyes. Itza was already awake. She'd brought a horn bowl of fresh water from the river. Ala was awake too. She stood in the doorway of the teepee and faced the east where the dawn sky glowed pink. With her eyes closed and her chin lifted, Ala sang a prayer of thanksgiving to Hanyawat and thanking him for a good night's sleep and the new day. Kaya silently joined him, joined Allah's prayer. Morning prayer songs were rising from all the teepees in the camp. The prayers over, Kaya stretched and yawned. Beside her, speaking rain rolled onto her back and reached for her folded dress. The twins were sitting on the deerskin blanket they shared. They held out their hands for the root cakes brown deer offered them. Brown deer had arisen before the camp crier passed by too. Although Kaya hoped to be as hardworking and generous as her older sister, right now Kaya wanted to stay curled up under her soft deer skin as long as possible. Ala turned with a smile as if she guessed Kaya's thoughts. Come girls, get up, she said. Roll up your bedding. It's time to bathe in the river. Every single morning of the year, in cold weather as well as warm, all the children went into the river to bathe. The cold water made them strong and healthy. Grandmothers and whip women watched the girls to make sure that they got clean. This morning, Kaya delighted in wading into the quiet place at the river bend. A salmon tickled her toes as she walked out onto the pebbly bottom to where the water reached her chest. As she splashed, the sun rose over Mount Syringa and flooded light into the green valley. Rabbit, a girl older than Kaya, ducked underwater and came up next to her. 
She shook drops from her gleaming hair and gave Kaya a sly smile. I don't know magpies could swim, she whispered. Kaya's cheeks burned. I can swim and faster than you, she said. Will you peck if you catch me? Rabbit laughed. With strong strokes, she began to swim for shore. Kaya swam after her. She could almost touch Rabbit's flashing heels, but she couldn't catch up to her. Kaya waded out of the river with her head bent. Magpie didn't win that race, Rabbit said with a grin. That nickname stung like a hornet. I let myself boast again, Kaya realized with dismay as she dressed. Kaya returned to their teepee, where she found her parents talking and laughing quietly together as Itza braided Tota's thick black hair. When, when Itza tried, had tied his braids together, Tota beckoned to Kaya. Let's go work with your horse, he said. Tota kept his best stallion runner tethered on a long rope near the camp. He put a horsehair rope on runner's lower jaw and mounted him bareback. He handed Kaya another rope bit and a long rope to carry. Then he lifted her up behind him on the big horse and they set out toward the herd. Kaya loved to ride with her father. She leaned against his warm back. The smooth gait of Tota's stallion rocked them gently. Tota, step, steps highs, tried to buck me off yesterday, she said. I thought so, Tota said. I saw you walking her. If you hadn't had trouble, you'd have been riding. I know your horse would never buck you. Buck you, Kaya said. Tota was quiet for a little while. Have I told you about the first time my father put me on a horse, he said. You've never told me that, Kaya said. I was a little boy. Even younger than your brothers, Tota said. One day my father put me on the gentle old horse my grandfather rode. He told me to ride around the camp slowly. But after I went around slowly, I wanted to go faster. I kicked the horse as I'd seen my grandmother do. The horse bolted. My father chased us, yelling to me to turn the horse uphill to slow him. I looked for a soft spot and jumped off into the grass instead. Were you hurt, Tota? Kaya asked. I was sore all over, he said. Do you know why I told you that story? Why, Tota? Kaya asked. I want you to know that no one is born knowing how to ride, he said. And you have to respect the horse you're riding. It takes a lot of work to learn what we need to know in this life. Tota swung runner alongside a group of mares. Steps High was grazing with them. Whistle for your horse, he told Kaya. She knows your whistle. When Steps High heard Kaya's whistle, she pricked up her ears. As she came forward, Tota tossed a rope around her neck and drew her close. Each time Kaya saw Steps High, she marveled at her horse's beauty. Steps High was both graceful and strong, the muscles rippling under her skin. Tota got off his stallion and lifted Kaya down as he approached steps high. She tossed her small hand, head, and rolled her eyes. Tota put the rope bit in her mouth, then grabbed a handful of mane as he swung onto her back. He held the rope reins firmly as she rode her away from the herd at a trot. Steps high pranced nervously, but she obeyed. Tota. He drew the horse to a halt again as Kaya, again by Kaya. Now it's your turn, he said. You're a strong rider. If you need me, I'm here to help. Kaya swung up onto her horse. Tota handed her the reins, but Kaya didn't urge Steps High forward. 
I won't push you too fast or too hard again, she whispered to her horse. I want you to trust me. Kaya pressed her knees to her horse's sides. She could feel a shiver run down the horse's back as Steps High began to walk. Steps High pushed against the bit as if she were thinking about running and bucking again, but she stayed at a walk until Kaya nudged her to trot. Kaya kept her horse gathered in and rode in slow circles until Tota motioned for her to come back to him. He took her horse's reins in one hand and stroked Steps High's neck. Tots, he said to Kaya, that's just how you must ride her for a long time. Stay slow and stay in control. Work with her a little longer, then come back to camp. Tota turned runner and rode off. As Kaya rode her horse in another circle, Foxtail rode up beside her. He'd been helping some older boys with the horses. His face was dusty and his lips were dry. Herding was hard work in the hot sun. Do you want to race again? He asked Kaya. Tota said, I can't race my horse for a long time, Kaya said. Foxtail's grin was a wicked one. I forgot that magpies don't race, he, he cried. He kicked his horse and galloped away from her. That nickname again. It gave Kaya a sick feeling in her stomach. She clenched her teeth as she circled steps high back to the herd. And we're going to stop right there and start with the next chapter on the next, the next video.